from? Yeah, I, I think that uh, it's true. Uh, as I said before, uh, also foreign policy is very much personal. So I will say I worked with a few, prim- a few, few leaders. Leaders are usually lonely people because at the end of the day, everyone is looking at them as a leader, not as a... They cannot relate to, peop- to too many people as friends, many people who were friends before and, and chemistry between them for them it's very important and I think that the chemistry is very evident. You have a photographer, he will tell you that there are some historic pictures of the two of them together standing in the waters of the sea in Khadera in Israel when Prime Minister Modi visit that it's, you know, it's a Pulitzer level picture in my because it tells everything about the body language and everything and also uh, they are them hugging and uh, ha- holding hands together in this air. So I think all of that is, is really it shows great chemistry. They are the same age. They same both of them are center right to the center, center right uh, uh, ideology. So I think that many things and practical people, you know, leading for many years. Uh, Netanyahu is the longest serving prime minister on and off in Israel uh, by now, and uh, Modi, of course, he was before chief minister. So they are in politics for many many years. So I, I think that all these elements probably are, you know very easy for them to communicate and and this is of course extremely important but I must say that also when uh, Prime Minister Modi met in uh, in Glasgow uh, Prime Minister Bennett they had a very good uh, meeting encounter so it's important this is the basis but also there it goes beyond so you know it, it has its own life I think the relations and I think that Prime Minister Modi sees Israel, at least my impression when I saw him, he, he sees Israel as a, as a country that is, is, a, is a great partner in many fields for India. Uh, b- and, you know, despite the fact that there is a humongous difference of size, of magnitude between our countries, India in population is something like 140 times Israel, and we, we are 10, 10, under 10 million people. And uh, in uh, in size, about 150 times. So it's the differences are huge. At the same time, Israel really is a cutting edge technological country in the world. And per, per capita, Israel is probably the leader, the world leader in innovation, the startup nation, as was titled in a book written about Israeli high tech technology. But even if we don't take it take it out of this context, uh, in real numbers. In many fields, Israel is the world leader in, in innovation, a country of less than 10 million people. Uh, in the number of startups per capita, of course, but in different fields, in the investment of the government into R&D, in, uh, in, uh, in, you know, in IPs, in high, high education. There are many elements where Israel is among the world leaders. And uh, I think, you know, we have about 90 unicorns from a country so small and think of it that uh, in order to create a unicorn coming out of a small market call it as a market it has to be international appeal Uh, it's not that you can build on say okay i have a product that is good enough for my only for my own market and this will become a unicorn a company of over one billion dollars in israel the market is not big enough for unicorns so Every, all the almost 90 unicorns had to be had to be with international wide appeal and cutting edge. Also, Israel is a, an expensive country, so you cannot we cannot be compete with countries with the mediocre technology, because we come with a premium. The price usually is high, and the only way you can sell something that is higher in price because it costs you more money to develop because you pay higher salaries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The whole process is more expensive. So the only way to do that is to come with cutting edge, something that is worth the price. And we don't, being a small country, we don't do uh, B2C, business to customer, hardly ever. We are not good at it. We are not upscaling country. We are quite an island, uh, not physically, not geographically, but because we our connections with our neighbors are limited. So we have to look uh, for export. So, you know, there are many elements that we, we, we don't have, uh, but that's why we go mainly to uh, business to business. So we are trying to bring technology that is, is relevant for businesses. And this is, 
I think, the strength of Israel. Uh, because businesses will always invest in technology. Uh, you know, if you come to the customer, if there is a year when he feels that he's a little bit pressurized financially and otherwise, so the, cust the customer will say, okay, this year I'll keep my old phone and not buy a new cellular phone because I feel a little bit stretched financially. I will wait with the same phone I wanted, but, but the business, in order to stay competitive, also in bad times, will have to invest. And I think this is a big... Uh, strength of Israel uh, being mainly B2B. Yeah, uh, w one of our challenges I think now is to think we reached a very sweet spot, a very comfortable position in our relations. Uh, we, we want to say in the 30th year of celebration of diplomatic relations, but we better say that in the last few years of the, of the diplomatic relations. And the question is, how do we bring value to the relations for the next 30 years? I think that the world is evolving, India is evolving, Israel is evolving, everything is changing. So thinking that what we had before in sight will be enough to keep us, to take us through and, and develop new things, it, it will not be sustainable. I think that we will have to be very um, creative and we are trying to look for new fields, for future fields, to try and predict a little bit the future and where India and Israel have uh, uh, together uh, some kind of quali qu qualitative edge over the world. Okay, that can, we can do things that are, you know, like quantum computers, uh, artificial intelligence, fields that are deep tech, fields that are more sophisticated harder that very few players are playing in this field because it's 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 demanding a lot know-how man capabilities money uh, so that's that's a strong element i think of the cooperation where we're trying to take we are trying to add a lot of people to people because i think that to maintain the high affection oh, by the way i spoke about how indians see israel i didn't spe speak about how israelis see india because it also goes the other way around. First of all, there was an immigration to Israel of, I think that the number of the Indian diaspora in Israel, we don't call them, your name is Indian diaspora, we call them Israelis. Because is, anyhow, Israel is built out of peop, Jews coming from more than 100 countries. But I think that the Indian diaspora is about 80,000 strong. And again, what is Indian diaspora? The second generation of Israelis meet, is uh, marrying an uh, Ashkenazi girl from uh, that the ancestors came from Europe, or or they uh, meet a Moroccan husband. Or, so you know, it's, uh, Israel is like that. It becomes a mixture. So, uh, but I think this diaspora is a is a strong element that we have uh, in our relations, in our ability also to to work together. That's one element, and uh, now uh, Rina Pushkerna, for example, a uh, uh, known chef who brought the Indian cuisine to Israel, received the high award of the President of India uh, just a couple of months ago. Uh, so Indian cuisine was already into Israel in the 70s. When I grew up, already I knew her restaurants. She's very young, but I know her restaurants since I was uh, a teenage, a late teenager. Uh, this is another element. Another element is the fact that uh, in Israel, we, when we had one channel, when I grew up at least, our generation, the, every Friday afternoon, four o'clock was the most, the high peak of, because Shabbat is coming in the Saturday, and people are already resting into, and the peak was the Friday afternoon film. And they used to alternate between Arab films from the Arab world, Egyptian films and others, and between Indian films. So we saw you see many people in Israel who grew up on that. You know, in peak time, watch my age, people my age. So, you know, all the Bollywood dances and everything, they know the music, they know songs and everything. And the, maybe the last and, and most important, because it's relevant for today, generations of Israelis chose to come to India for, I would call it, full immersion visit after the military service. Quite many of these. And what do I mean by full immersion? They are backpackers, really. They live, they want to live. It doesn't matter if their background, they have money or not money. This is not the issue. The issue is not about having five-star hotels. They want to live here for quite a few months, up to a year, according to the visa regulations, and to 
live like Indians. They go and take yoga courses and they do, you know, they go to Sile, to Vipassana and they, they do whatever, you know, they want to live here and, and, and absorb the culture. And when they go back to Israel, they take the knowledge and the love to India. Many of them, we, we have a Facebook group, a very strong one of Israelis in, uh, traveling in India which is generations. So you, you have there people who are 60 years old, 60 plus years old, and uh, people who are now finishing the military and they are exchanging, where should I go, where should, you know. It's, it's a very lively, a very big group. So we have now the second generation of the parents who went and now are taking their children, when the children are teenagers, to show them their experience of India. So if you go in Israel, you find many people who know a lot and has, have a lot of appreciation and love towards India. So it goes both ways. There was a bigger argument before, but I lost in mind. But that, that is the, the line. No, I, I think that Israel, by the way, is not a competitor to most of the Russian equipment because Russians sell far and the foremost things are the the platforms what we call the, uh, ships planes aircraft uh, this big israel doesn't manufacture we are a small country we see no no logic in manufacturing the big things uh, what we do we do the the high end technology that goes with them so if you have a platform which is a russian suhoi all the we can probably provide the best in the best of its kind when it comes to defense, electronic defense on the plane, uh, missiles, radars, all the avionics around the plane and, you know, take the new Indian uh, uh, carrier, uh, home-built carrier, uh, you know, the defense systems, the missiles there are Indian-Israeli missiles, joint venture, that are defending it. So. This is where we are. We are not. We are not. Never. So the competition on the on the on on these elements like ships, uh, it's more with bigger countries like the U.S. Uh, that they they will compete with Russia. Like France is sending planes. We are not there. We are not in that business. Uh, and I think uh, our qualitative edge will stay uh, on this. I mean, there are countries who can s who do systems that are. Uh, similar, uh, but I think that we are very agile in our ability to work. I think that Make in India, that uh, is is still in the makings. I think it's not ripe yet for no big deals were signed in the last five years. Part of it is connected to that. Uh, some see it as a challenge. It is a challenge for everyone. It's a challenge for India. It's a challenge for countries to to work with India on this, on the f field of defense, because it's a very sensitive field. At the same time, <coughs> uh, I see it as an opportunity, because I think that because of the closeness and the deep trust between India and Israel, uh, and the agility of our, you know, the way we think in a very, we are very, uh, also very similar to India. We are not the best planners in the world, but we know how to come out good out of situations because we can improvise. Improvisation, last minute improvisation, we are also, I think it's also another similarity, you know, in, I, I, I've spent in Western Europe uh, some of my career where the people, you know, they know five years ahead how they will do things and exactly how it will be implemented and it will happen as they plan because they are also very, Israel doesn't have this quality. In, mm -hmm. in, no, 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 I don't. I think that also India. But we are very good. We, what we, they don't have, and we do have, is the ingenuity to because we have to improvise. You know, for them it's hard to improvise because improvise is not planning. They are good in planning, and we are stronger. I think both of us in in doing short term improvisation or thinking or fast tracking things once we need to. You know, Israel built the Iron Dome because there was the need and necessity in an amazing, like two, three years already, the first uh, trial. I mean, the first time in the world that someone designed a missile to hit a missile and bring it, or rocket to hit the rocket, missile to hit the rocket really, and to bring it down. So, you know, this was science fiction. And we did it in a very short time. Why? Because there was a necessity and a threat on our uh, civilians. 
And we came out and did it. And again, I'm sure that if the Americans would put their minds to it, they could have done it, I don't think in our timetable and not in our low cost also, because if you do it in two, three years, you also reduce tremendously the costs, uh, because less man hour. I mean, more people would work on it, and, but it's, it's uh, so I think this is an element where it will continue. The make in India, again, I see it as more, as a challenge, because it's challenge, but for us, for Israel especially, as a great opportunity also. So our trade is really, uh, I saw, by the way, India, India's figures came out, Israel, the figures for 2022 did not come out yet. I saw the Indian figures, I was shocked. It was so high, the jump was so big. So before COVID, we had about a mutual trade of about $5 billion. And now, by the Indian tr uh, numbers of 2022, we are over $10 billion. So there was an incredible jump. 11 Yeah, with, with services and everything, it's closer to 11, I think. And with, it's without defense. We're speaking only civilian, of course. So the jump is amazing. I think that um, it's you know it's a good opportunity also to go for FTA. It's not easy because uh, there are differences, as I said, of magnitude of size of market. And India and Israel are wanting conflicting things from each other. Each one wants its what is if things serve them better. And also our teams are working. That the same teams, both in India, because I speak to the teams, and in Israel, who work on FTA with all the world. It's this FTA doesn't work, matter with which country you do. So India in parallel now is negotiating with at least six, seven countries, if not more. Israel is doing the same, and it's very hard to focus. I hope that if the, we will have a high-level prime minister level, it, it will make the working level focus towards on FTA towards the visit, you know start to, okay, make it practical and make it work. I don't know, but this is my optimistic hope. So I, I think that uh, specifically, um, you know, countries have become, in the, uh, have become in the last years more and more aware of their strategic assets. They are a little bit more cautious about who they give control and access to the strategic assets. And I think that the fact that uh, we have in Israel only two ports. Israel is an island, de facto island, as I said before, because of the neighborhood and everything. <coughs> and uh, since we, we have three ports, one is in Eilat to the Red Sea towards Asia, so the exit towards Asia. The other two are the Mediterranean, uh, going towards Europe and, uh, and the West. Out of these two, Adani is holding now one of the ports. So for us, it's a tremendously strategic uh, asset. And the fact that we deposit this asset in hands of an Indian company, regardless now if it's this or another Indian company, I think it's a huge sign of, of trust that is, is there between our systems, between our countries. You know, at the end of the day, on these decisions, they are made by governments. So the whole process of the tender is a government tender. The whole process of uh, you know looking at the strategic security elements of that are done by the governments. And I think that after this long process, the fact that an Indian company was cleared to go forward and won it, it's a wonderful news for us. It's the biggest Indian investment so far in Israel. <coughs> and I, I think that Adani you know, the, uh, and you know, we cannot ignore everything, all the noises uh, around Adani since they, they won this tender. Adani uh, paid upfront the whole sum that they had to pay for winning the tender. It's, I, I believe that ports is their bread and butter of their business and they know how to create And the Haifa port is not as good as it should have been when it comes to the performance, uh, business performance. And I believe that, uh, Adani Group has the capability and the wish and the need also from their, on their behalf to bring this port to be the port it should be. And so I, I, I'm, I try to be in life in general optimistic and I carry that also to, the, to, you know, to this topic and hoping that it will be. But for me, the important thing is the is this signal of, of trust of Israel towards India. We can deposit in your hands our most sensitive 
uh, infrastructure. I think this is maybe the important message coming out of it. Yeah, the the the, 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 the Abraham Accords in general and I to you to afterwards we can also speak about. I think that they are a game changer. So for many years, um, countries were saying, uh, no, you know, uh, there is the Palestinian issue, and until the Palestinian issue is resolved, we will not work with Israel. So many Arab countries, India said it in one way or another. By the way, India was probably the pioneer leading the camp here because the so-called dehyphenation policy is saying that, they're saying, look, the Palestinian issue is there. They're saying it about many countries when it comes to Israel. The Palestinian issue is there, Israel is there. We have to deal with Israel, it's our interest. We can, we can bring some benefits to our own population by dealing with Israel, we will do that. And we will do, deal also with the Palestinian issue. We are not tying the two together. The Palestinian issue is the Palestinian issue. We have our opinions, we say them from time to time. And the Israeli uh, issue is the Israeli issue, and we have interest and we pursue them. And I think this is a very pragmatic and smart policy. In other words, that's what the UAE, Bahrain, Morocco, who joined later on, did in this, they said, look, for years, in other words, in years we have been s fighting for the rights of the Palestinians. And uh, we were giving them political support and financial support and other support. And it didn't bring, first of all, they saw that it's not taking the, you know, you cannot, uh, you can, as we say in Hebrew, you can bring the camel to the water, you cannot make him drink. So, you know, they, they also gave up a little bit of what's happening in the Palestinian side, I believe some extent that said, okay, it's not going to happen now, so we cannot keep our relations, the, you know, the peace, the so wanted peace, will probably not happen uh, tomorrow, so we cannot keep our uh, interests, our citizens' interests, hostage for that. So they, it's not that they're ignoring uh, the Palestinian issue, they are still speaking about it, you can hear from time to time, uh, uh, when there are events and they, they refer to them, but they are not keeping their relations with Israel hostage. And this is a wonderful change. And especially the UAE is very unique for the trilateral with Israel and India because of the such strong presence of uh, Indians in the in, in UAE in general, but in the economy, UAE, UAE economy especially. And I think that here the potential for triangles, uh, here we have the I to U2, which is India, Israel, uh, the, uh, the two I's, and UAE and United States are the other two U's. I think that this is, uh, you know, there a lot of potential there in this way to, to go forward. Uh, because we have the potential of combining government powers and wishes with private sector. Because the idea is to help or umbrella the private sector for projects that we identify and together we go and so if there is a governmental need for regulation or anything, the governments are also there. And it will be, and now, you know, it's, it's still in a process in the making that two projects are decided already, few other in the pipeline, it will take time. The, w the multilateral world is paralyzed. Once you have two strong countries opposing each other, whatever they do. And this is where we back to the Cold War in other ways. So it's a zero sum game, whatever US will say, Russia will say the other way, etc, etc. So, you know, once you are there, and then China is there in the game, you know, it's a messy, messy and multilateral, you are mostly paralyzed or very hard to move or to, to take new initiatives. There are some things that are working like the COP, the COP, you know, the environment, but most things are stuck. And then you go to minilaterals, and this is like-minded states, like we're doing in the ITU2, working together to benefit their citizens and hopefully also the region and the world, because in ITU2 we took projects that are uh, f environment friendly also, so uh, alternative energy uh, farms, uh, food farms, which will be very advanced, very economical, very ecological. So, you know, all that stuff, I think that uh, has a huge potential to, to succeed and we are 
We are even hoping to do more trilaterals with India, with other countries. So this is also in the pipeline that we are sp speaking together, how we can help the two of us, third countries, that it's our interest to work together and help them.